players in the Super Bowl celebrate after they score touchdowns. God shows Gideon that courage celebrates even before the game begins. Good morning, Cross Life family. Love seeing you here on Sundays. Sundays, uh, it's, this is the best place for you to be as long as you can be here. We have components of worship that happen here on Sunday morning that build our community together and that you can't get anywhere else. But a good second place is uh, Facebook Live. So welcome to Facebook Live viewers who are some here in town, some a long distance. Glad to have you here today. And you might see a few of our people attending here today, our Cross Life family members, commenting on Facebook Live. We want that. That's interactive learning, and that helps with retention. And so go ahead and do that. If I see you with your phones, I know that you're not watching Super Bowl commentary, but you're uh, commenting on Facebook Live. Special bonus today, Facebook Live viewers. I'm going to read a portion of the book of Judges today, and there's some kind of some strange parts in there. So if you have any question about what I'm reading today or about anything in today's message, post a question. I'll get back to you by Monday morning. I'll look at the questions and I'll answer them unless some other astute, theologically trained person on Facebook Live answers them first. That's okay too. But you can post your questions today on there and I'll answer them. Welcome also YouTube viewers. Uh, remember to scribe, subscribe to our YouTube channel and you'll get the message rewind every week uh, as well as the children's message that you can watch, the children's message that comes with the notification. And everyone, please watch and share these videos so we can share Jesus with the world. Today is week five of our Dreamer series and it begins in a wine press. And in that wine press is a man named Gideon. Gideon is an Israelite, and so he's a man of Israel, God's chosen people of faith in ancient times. God wanted to work among this, this people to show his grace and mercy to all of the nations, but working in them specifically. And so here's Gideon, an Israelite, and he's in a wine press, except he's not trampling grapes. He's threshing grain in a wine press. You don't do that. But Gideon was doing that, and here's why. A, a wine press is typically a, a bit more of a sheltered kind of thing on the side of a hill. Normally, you would thresh grain. Grain is, uh, has the, the kernel of grain and the husk around it, and threshing grain meant with, with some kind of friction. Sometimes animals would trample on it. Sometimes you'd put it in a grinder. You would cause some friction to the grain, and then you'd throw it up in the air, and you'd typically do that on the top of a hill because there'd be wind, and the wind would blow away the, you don't know what that's called? The chaff. It would blow away the chat, and so all the husks and all that dust would blow away, and the grain would land back down here, and you'd have clean grain. Gideon was not doing that. Well, he was doing that, but in a wine press, because he was hiding, because he was scared, because he was worried, because there were enemies out there who opposed him, that, that he was not popular with the enemies. The enemies were the Midianites, and the Midianites were raiding and invading the land of Israel. If they noticed that he was threshing grain, they'd come and confiscate it and take it, maybe worse. On the scene then, where Gideon is threshing grain in the wine press, uh, God finds Gideon, a worried, fearful man, and says this, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Really? Gideon replies. Actually, the, the, <laughs> the Bible there says, he says, Pardon me? Excuse me? You, I, I'm an Israelite. The Midianites are invading and raiding our land. They're stronger than we are. I'm a, I'm a small clan, and I'm the weakest in my clan. God, you got the wrong guy. God continues, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites. Question, is that a command or a promise? Yes, it's both. God never gives a command without giving a Yep, and so these are command, these are promise type words. I'll be with you. You will attack. This is like God telling Gideon, uh, Gideon, you're going to do this. And also God telling Gideon, Gideon, you're going to do this. Both at the same time. So here's the initial plan God says, Gideon, you're my man, you're the mighty warrior, and you're going to have courage. And here's what I want you to do I want, Gideon, I want you to prepare your own send off party so that you can uh, take the Israelites and go attack the Midianites. And your send-off party looks like this. Gideon, go take your father's prize bull. 
How much is a stud bull worth to a rancher? Everything. I want you to take your father's prize bull. I want you to sacrifice that to me, Gideon. And the, the wood that I want you to burn the bull on, I want you to destroy your father's favorite pagan, idol-worshiping church. All the wood frame, all the wooden pews, and the wooden steeple, I want you to take it all down and burn it in a fire and put that bull on it and sacrifice it to me. And Gideon did. And then he wasn't just not popular with his enemies, he was not popular with his family and with the town people. As a matter of fact, a mob riot formed and they all said, he must die. Courage isn't always popular, except with God. When your courage is God-given and God-formed, it may not be popular, but it is with God. And look at what God asked Gideon here to do. God wants you to be courageous like Gideon, and he asks you to do two things, like he asked Gideon. Number one, come out of hiding. Come out of the shadows. Come out of faking and pretending. Come out of shrinking back. Come out of not fully trusting and believing in this great and awesome God. Come out of it. Number two, be willing. If God's asking you to be courageous, he's asking you to be willing to commit to sacrificing for him when it may not be popular with everyone else. That's what he asked Gideon to do, and and Gideon did. Look at it this way. Uh, Courage is based more on values than on votes. More on God's values, biblical values that are established for us by God. And these are principles and pillars of life. So build your courage on those and don't worry about the votes of popular opinion. Jesus had to do that. Jesus built his ministry. Jesus suffered and died because he was so committed to the values that he had eternally. And his number one value, more, more popular than the votes of popular opinion, more popular than, than the devil's votes who came to Jesus with lies and offered him actually a better deal than suffering and dying for the sins of the world. Jesus valued this more than his disciples' votes when they tried to dissuade him from going to Jerusalem and dying. More than the votes of the crowd that actually called for his crucifixion, which is where he was headed, but it didn't define that the condemnation. They condemned him as a criminal. And because of Jesus' values, he knew he wasn't a real criminal. He knew he was the Savior of the world. And this value that drove Jesus and gave him courage was that he played for an audience of one. His father and his father's approval and agenda was more important to Jesus than everybody else is put together. Can you get up every morning and say, Father, you're my audience of one today. The agenda that I'm seeking today, I want to be your agenda, God. More than mine, more than what everyone else gives me. The identity that I live with today, God, I want to be, Father, I want to be what you give me, and that's more important than what everyone else tells me I am. That's courage. That allows you to be the mother of a baby whose doctor tells you, you need to, you need to abort this baby because it has this disease and that disease, and, and you're at this risk, and lets you be the mother who says, I'm going to give birth to this child, and I'm going to pray hard and I'm going to parent hard, or maybe I'm going to give it up for adoption, but I will not end the life of an unborn baby. I don't care, doctor, what you tell me. I'm going to have courage and put it in God's hands. Courage is a church and a school ministry that bases what we want to do as a strategy for growth, inner growth and outer growth, as a strategy building on values more than votes of popular opinion. That takes courage and control and discipline. Our values, loving, life-changing, 
family, as a church, are beautiful values. There's other values too, and that are good values, but we need to focus on these, and when we do, that's courageous ministry. We're going to see God bless that. All right, so that, that was just my introduction. I'm just getting to go on. That was just my introduction. So now we're going to actually read from Judges chapter 7. So Gideon has responded to God's call to courage. Gideon has burned the bull in a sacrifice. He's, he's the, the, the pagan temple and, and church pews and steeple that his dad owned are gone, and actually his dad now is getting on board with this thing and coming to his defense. Gideon has gathered an Israelite army of 32,000 men. All right, that's part of this story. Here we go. Judges chapter 7, beginning at verse 1. Early in the morning, Jerob Baal, that is Gideon, and all his men camped at the spring of Herod. The camp of Midian was north of them in the valley near the hill of Morah. The Lord said to Gideon, you have too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into their hands, or Israel would boast against me. My own strength has saved me. Now announce to the army, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 men left, leaving 10,000. But the Lord said to Gideon, there are still too many men. Take them down to the water, and I will thin them out for you there. If I say, this one shall go with you, he shall go. But if I say, this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. So Gideon took the men down to the water. There the Lord told him, separate those who lap the water with their tongues as a dog laps from those who get down on their knees to drink. Three hundred of them drank from cupped hands, lapping like dogs. All the rest got down on their knees to drink. The Lord said to Gideon, with the three hundred men that lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands. Let the others go home. So Gideon sent the rest of the Israelites home, but kept the three hundred who took over the provisions and trumpets of the others. Now, the camp of Midian lay below them in the valley. During the night, the Lord said to Gideon, Get up, go down against the camp, because I am going to give it into your hands. If you are afraid to attack, go down to the camp with your servant Pura and listen to what they're saying. Afterward, you will be encouraged to attack the camp. So he and Pura, his servant, went down to the outposts of the camp the Midianites, the Amalekites, and all the other eastern peoples had settled in the valley thick as locusts. Their camels could no more be counted than the sand on the seashore. Gideon arrived just as a man was telling a friend his dream. I had a dream, he was saying. A round loaf of barley bread came tumbling into the Midianite camp. It struck the tent with such force that the tent overturned and collapsed. His friend responded, this can be nothing other than the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, the Israelite. God has given the Midianites and the whole camp into his hands. When Gideon heard the dream and its interpretation, he bowed down and worshipped. He returned to the camp of Israel and called out, Yay, God! Get up! The Lord has given the Midianite camp into your hands, said to his army. Dividing the 300 men into three companies, he placed trumpets and empty jars in the hands of all of them with torches inside. Read the rest of Judges 7 for the rest of the story. But Gideon goes on and attacks the Midianites with the men and conquers them. So kids, I, I gave you a Lego piece. Uh, grab your Lego piece right now, please, and hold that up for me. Okay. Have any of you ever started a Lego building project? And you line up all your Legos, they're all there, you're sitting in your playroom and they're all around you and not even close to you, there's some still over in the closet and they're everywhere, but they're all yours and you're using them and you're going to make, you're gonna have a Lego building project and you're going to make this thing that you're, you've dreamed about and you can't wait to create it. And then mom hollers from the other room, your sister wants to build something too. Make sure that you share the Legos with her. Oh, no. Building project ruined, right? Oh, you, why 
whine and complain and you cry and you pout and you leave and you don't want to do the building project anymore because it's ruined and you're all sad and you're angry and then dad comes home and you complain to him and he, he comes, he says, let's show me. And you show him just your little limited Lego pile, not the whole thing because you had to share. And he takes this little limited Lego pile and your dad makes this awesome castle spaceship thing. And it is so cool. You've never seen anything like it. And you, and you say, look what I did. No, you don't say that. What do you say? I have the most awesome dad. And you take pictures of it and you put it on Facebook and on Instagram and you tell you and you have the awesome. And guess what? He did something that you thought you couldn't do with the limited Legos that you had. That's what God is doing with, the, with Gideon and the army. It's exactly what God was doing. He, he comes to Gideon and he says, you have too many men. This is chapter 7, verse 2. You have too many men. I, pay attention here, God says. I cannot. God, the, the almighty, all-powerful God says, I cannot. I cannot deliver Midian into the hands of your men, Gideon, into their hands, or Israel will boast against me. My own strength has saved me. There's two problems with that. My own strength has saved me. Number one, your own strength can't save you, ever. It can save you from some things, but not all things. And number two, when your own strength does save you from some things, we tend to boast in ourselves and not in God. When you think that your own strength saves you, that's a self-reliance that, that removes you from God's can and puts you into God's cannot, and it's not God's fault. When you think your own strength saves you, your self-importance interferes with God's can so that it becomes God's cannot. He says this right here. So with less than 1% of his army, less, he started, Gideon started with 32,000 men, and now he has 300. I'm not good at math, but I believe that's less than 1%. Is that correct? Okay. With less than 1% of what Gideon thought that he needed, God is now telling him, now we're going to do this, and it's going to happen. Courage works best when we have less so that God can do more. Don't be afraid of God asking you to share your Legos. Don't be afraid of God actually taking away some of your Legos. Don't be afraid of the spreadsheet that you put together for your church committee, for your for your family budget, and you've you got that spreadsheet, and there's empty boxes that don't make sense, and they're not helping with the formula of success, don't be afraid of those empty boxes. And, and I tell you what, better than not being afraid of them, write something in them. Just write God. Don't be afraid of starting a small group in your home, of, of, of leading a Bible study. Don't be afraid of witnessing to your friends. When you have less and you're equipped with fewer resources than you think that you need, when you have the 1% of what you think you needed, don't be afraid of that. God is saying, have courage. When you have less, that's exactly what God wants because that allows Him to do more. It allows Him to get more involved and allows Him to get the glory. With his band of 300 men, Gideon does go to attack the, uh, the massive army of the Midianites. The Bible says here in Judges, they're thick as locusts. Is Gideon still afraid? As he gathers his army, he only has now the 300, and he goes to the camp and he sees that, they're, that the Midianites and the Amalekites and the eastern peoples are thick as locusts, and, and they're, you can't... You can count the sand on the seashore, but they're more than that? Absolutely, he's afraid. So God tells him, if you're afraid, this is verse 10 and 11, 
If you're afraid to attack, go down to the camp, the Midianite camp, with your servant Pura, and listen to what they're saying. Afterward, you will be encouraged to attack the camp. God does not say, I, oh, Gideon, I'm so sorry. You're scared. I'm, I'm sorry to make you scared. I shouldn't be doing that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take all your fears away. You name it, Gideon. Whatever you're afraid of, I'll take care of it for you. God doesn't say that. God says, Gideon, you're afraid? It's okay. It's okay to be afraid, but it's not okay for your fear to paralyze you. It's not okay for your fear to immobilize you, Gideon. So, I'm going to give you something that's so much more important than your fear that you're going to forget your fear and you're going to want to do that important thing. You know, like your family's at the, um, the, at the part, Six Flags, you know, and there's a big roller coaster and you got your seven-year-old and, and you know, they, they're scared of the roller coaster or your spouse uh, or your 17-year-old, right? Or anyone in your family who doesn't want to go on the roller coaster, but the ro- that's such a big deal. That going on the roller coaster is so important. What do you do? You face your fears. You go on the roller coaster. And maybe it's even a traumatic experience, but after you're done, at the very least, you face your fears. If you're me, you get back on the roller coaster again, and you, you realize what fun it is, and you keep going. The, so courage is not the absence of fear, but the conviction that God is more important than fear. God is more important than fear. Gideon hears that from God. Gideon understands. God is telling him, Gideon, this is not about your story. God is saying, Gideon, this is, this is my story. This is God's story. And when Gideon realizes that it's God's story and not his, that's what motivates and inspires him to walk forward even in fear. Even Jesus recoiled in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus says his, that his soul was overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Jesus is saying, this is killing me even before I get to the cross that's supposed to kill me. Jesus is saying, I'm dying here of, of sorrow. You could even say of fear, of anxiety. It's not that Jesus, was, Jesus is the Son of God, and, he's, and He has this. You and I can have fears and anxiety as Christians, too. It doesn't make us not Christian. Fear and anxiety controlling us and immobilizing us and paralyzing us. That didn't happen to Jesus, and it shouldn't happen to us either. Jesus prayed through it. Jesus focused on his Father's will, and it was all about it being his Father's story and not Jesus' own story. Jesus, we said before, don't be afraid of less. Philippians 2 tells us that that Jesus became nothing on the cross. Jesus was reduced to nothing, and only then could he become everything. Jesus walked into the Garden of Gethsemane with fear, but something became more important than that fear, and that was pleasing his heavenly Father, his audience of one, and now he wants you to do the same thing. He's not asking you to never be afraid. There are times when you shouldn't, but there's times when you just can't help it. But he's asking you to walk into that fear. Courage is fear walking. Do you want that kind of courage and say yes? Okay, courage is fear sacrificing. Are you ready for that kind of courage? Say yes. Courage is fear showing mercy to people who don't deserve it. Are you willing to show that kind of courage? Say yes. It's going to be courage today in this big, huge football game we celebrate in our country, the Super Bowl. These are courageous athletes, courageous coaches and owners. Uh, It's a feat of excellence. It's fun to watch. You see feats of excellence in the advertisements too. It's a a great afternoon and there's celebration going on. Um, Have you caught this, that there's new celebration in the National Football League? That recently the rules changed and they've allowed 
players, not just to spike the ball. The kids talked before about spiking the ball in the end zone. But they, they're allowing players to do a lot more in the end zone than just spiking the ball, like more than touchdown dances even. And so here, Roger Goodell said this, the NFL commissioner, when they relaxed the rules, this is very recently, he said, we saw a lot of interest in allowing the players a little more freedom to express their joy and their individuality and frankly, celebrate the game. So what we've seen in, after touchdowns, like these celebrations, like mock weightlifting routines and rock, rock'em sock'em robots, and the players are all acting this out. One team actually a- acted out bowling, or the other players lined up as bowling pins, and then he pretended to bowl or, or bowled the football, and it knocked him over. And all this is intended. They've uh, enacted mov- movie scenes. Even one with Nolan Ryan. There's a movie scene with Nolan Ryan. They they reenacted. And so you're seeing all this crazy celebration after touchdowns. Let me ask you this. How do you celebrate God? Let me be more specific. When do you celebrate God? All the time. Including this time. Notice, don't let this escape you. This hit me as I was studying this. This is the fourth and final lesson of courage that we have from Gideon today. When did Gideon celebrate God. So God sent him to look. He, hadn't fought, he had gathered his 300 men. God sent him to look at the Midianite camp. Oh, they're, they're more numerous than the sand on the seashore. He sees how big and numerous they are. And, and he hears this dream from the, from the Midianite man. Now pay attention. When Gideon heard the dream and its interpretation, he bowed down and worshiped. Then he returned to the camp of Israel and called out, Get up! The Lord has given the Midianite camp into your hands. When did Gideon celebrate God? Before the battle! Not after the victory. He celebrated then too. Anybody can celebrate after the victory. NFL players can celebrate after a touchdown. This is Gideon on the 41-yard line. There's .6 seconds left. It's fourth down and 26 yards to go for a first down. And he's behind by 28 points, and he's doing a touchdown dance in the middle of the field before the final play. Courage. Courage celebrates God, not just after the victory, but before the battle. Gideon showed courage by doing that. So today... Today you're sitting on your sofa and next to your nachos and queso and your team scores a touchdown and you jump up to celebrate and you spill queso all over the place and nacho chips are flying and you say, yay for my team. Just get, let that give you a small picture, a small picture of what celebrating God looks like because God comes to you and he says, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. And you celebrating God with courage is something that says, after God says to you, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior, you say, and I am with you too. Let's go, God. Yay, God! Amen. Let's pray. God, you are great and you are amazing, most of all because you are so gracious. Most of all, because you sent your son Jesus to the cross. In him, our fears that paralyze us are forgiven and gone. In him, our insistence on knowing the way better than you do disappears. In him, our cowardice, our hesitation, and our hiding is forgiven and paid for. Thank you for the blood of Jesus on the cross that saves us from our sins, Heavenly Father. May that saving of Jesus not just save us from the bad, but but also set us apart for the good, as you promised. May the cross give us courage. May your words to Gideon today that gave him courage long ago give us courage still today. Courage to speak and to serve and to sacrifice and to say your name, courage to celebrate you all the time. It is in the powerful name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.
Do you want more courage in making decisions or tackling your problems? Have your fears kept you from moving forward? God can change all that. By His grace, He forgives you and promises the Lord is with you. Be with Him. Pray to Him. Find your courage in Him. And follow us on YouTube and Facebook for the rest of the Dreamer series. What has God given you courage to do? We'd love to hear about it and encourage others by your story, so please comment below. Thanks for watching and for gifts that support our video ministry.